Um, welcome everybody, thank you for joining us today. It is uh, for the first event, the first lecture in the uh, winter quarter. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that as a land grant institution, the Department of Architecture and Urban Design at UCLA recognizes our presence on the traditional, ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. It is a pleasure to introduce tonight's guest, Florian um, Edenberg. Uh, Florian is a partner in the New York-based architecture firm So Eel, which he co-founded with Jing Liu in 2008. Their practice as architecture, installation, exhibition, and furniture uh, design. And in addition to being an expert on um, structural and spatial form, he's an accomplished writer and educator. So it is a world-renowned architecture firm with public and private, uh, private clients spread around the globe, including projects in France, South Korea, Spain, the, the United States, and Mexico. Uh, Jing and Florian call New York home, but like their projects themselves and the collective that forms the office comes from everywhere. And this international makeup is key in defining and understanding their design philosophy and production. So it has been featured in the New York Times, CNN, Domus, Architects newspaper, and in the recent A plus C monographs titled Unfinished Business, among others. Their work is in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art, the Guggenheim Museum, the Art Institute of Chicago, just to name a few. The team has also received numerous awards, including the Bilcek Award, the Curb Groundbreakers Award, the MoMA PS1 Young Architects Program Award, the American Academy of Arts and Letters um, Award in Architecture, the United States Artist Fellow Prize, and many others. Um, Soil's mission statement begins, if you go to their website, with a bolded single sentence that reads, we produce future culture. I feel like I could, uh, or perhaps I should, uh, end the introduction right there. Uh, the sentence and the work of the office can sustain the boldness and clarity of the project being claimed, but so rarely these days we find agents of architecture or of culture or of any meaningful public engagement project that speaks or positions themselves with such succinct clarity and resolution that I thought the talk should be introduced relative to that act. I am sure that everybody in this room that engages with architecture journalism or project-based media or academic mission statements, uh, there are both tropes and keywords that consistently appear in everybody's agenda. There are, uh, that are uh, centered around the desire and belief in architecture's capacity to contribute positively to critical social and environmental issues and the articulation of how space-making practices might contribute to those goals. Um, this is also true for the work of Soil, but this is done again with a degree of specificity and clarity that char characterizes the Soil project in a unique and extremely compelling way. The terms of engagement connect, uh, and I quote, physical properties with history to produce interventions that are both respectful of their past and adaptable to a dynamic future with a goal to create environments and objects that inspire lasting positive intellectual and so uh, societal engagement, end quote. How the, architectural arc, uh, how the architectural archive gets mined and activated to produce a contemporary project, how the tectonic history of our discipline is probed and transformed to produce new material cultures, and by association new spatial experiences, and how the reading and reframing of context and context parameters, both conceptual and physical, produce new ideas for established architectural typologies are a few of the many qualities that make soil projects so compelling, so intriguing, both of its time and as the locus of architectural invention. Please join me in welcoming Florian oh, wow. to Edith. <laughs> Sometimes I, you don't have to give a lecture anymore after the introduction is, is done, and we can just look at the, the slides, and this is one of them. Thank you very much for that um, introduction. Um, Let's see, I, um, I'm going to show um, some recent and some older work, and I, I am actually showing something that just came in today, so we're going to show it for the first time um, at the end, um, and I promise not to, um, to share it with anybody, um, but I will with you, um, since I've not been here for a long time. Uh, Jing uh, and I, indeed, we are in New York, we're working in New York, and we work around the world, um, and you, you, you mentioned sort of local um, specificity and the way we think about um, 
sort of what it means to work um, within a context. And recently our context has been shifting a little bit um, because of COVID, more is happening in New York. Um, also the practice has been growing a little bit. And so we're feeling sort of new uh, pressures in a way um, emerging uh, on uh, the practice. And I wanted to talk about that today. And I wanted to talk about the role of the architect uh, today and sort of how do we engage with uh, realities? How do we engage with uh, making uh, space? Uh, Jing and I, and maybe in the mission statement as well, you could read um, something that sounds like a, like a modernist in a way. And a modernist uh, today is not a really um, sort of uh, en vogue uh, approach um, because uh, it has shown sort of its limitations. And I think if you, if you think about um, the architect today uh, engaged sort of in a reality and believing still um, that in the physical uh, environments that we create, there can be uh, optimism and maybe hope and, and progress. Uh, sometimes we have to reflect on, you know, what are we doing uh, there? And so recently um, we, we had a conversation with a very large, um, um, I would say, well, let's just say developer um, in, in New York City. And some of the work we will show um, today we showed and we discussed, we were on the top of a skyscraper overlooking uh, New York City, and they, it was a very animated um, and um, positive um, uh, presentation, and we had, we laughed. And at the end, the man, he said, fantastic work. Um, I wrote one word down, inefficient. <laughs> <laughs> and we started to think about this. What does that mean? And actually, what is it that we have to do, right, as architects? What is, is, is our role um, to, to strive for efficiency? Is that sort of the ultimate goal um, that we have, um, you know, engaging uh, in our contemporary reality? And if you start looking at the, at the history and the history of the architect and the history of the architect in New York, it is a history, right, of, of optimization. It is a history of thinning things, so to say, of, of reducing things, of, of, re of eliminating materials and letting materials do um, you know, more and more on a thinner um, and sort of less uh, defined uh, surface. And so if, if we celebrate these projects, if this, if this is what, you know, efficiency, so to say, is, if, if this is what architecture is, then, you know, is that something we want to um, partake in? Um, there is, um, over time, right, um, Jacques Tati, others, uh, the, the question of the, you know, the alienating effects of, of modernity, right? And um, the, the, this idea of, of transparency uh, and uh, the idea maybe of that sort of continuity that is there, there's no space for escape uh, within that. But if you think about, you know, a, a lot of what we end up doing today um, as architects, and maybe this has the best um, illustration, is that this is where the sort of value add maybe is for architects who operate in reality, right? Um, but in that reality, there's, you know, people are forgotten sometimes. They don't fit right within that system. They don't fit on the inside from this very thin line, this thin line uh, that produces value. Uh, and outside is where work happens, or outside is where, you know, other life forms um, die. Um, and maybe what is interesting is, F, you know, in, in today's day and age, with sort of the realities and the, 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 the social um, realities that, that cities are facing, a lot of these promises of openness and transparency, they actually don't really hold true when push comes to shove, right? And so what does it mean to believe in this idea of, of modernity? Um, and so we, we, we've always been interested in less um, clear modernity, maybe a less <laughs> sharp modernity, a less graphic modernity, maybe something softer, right? Maybe something more fuzzy, maybe something more um, atmospheric um, with depth, possibly. Um, and, and, you know, uh, accommodating other types of uh, ecologies. And so a lot of our work thinks, um, you know, is fundamentally thinking about what does it mean uh, to be um, sort of in our contemporary context and what is the way in which we physically experience this and what is the relationship to the structures uh, around us. And so throughout our work, we have been thinking through these questions uh, with temporary installations that, you know, uh, for MoMA PS1, a, um, a, a Cartesian grid as a metaphor for this uh, modern idea, but not one that is stable, one that is instable and can collapse at any moment where we as user, as, uh, as interface, are responsible for its stability, actually. Or installations, we worked together with Anna Pravacci, who used to live here in LA. We once taught a workshop here 
um, on an installation that makes us think about um, really directly what is the space that we really need uh, around us and what is the air uh, that we breathe and how can we through um, our work, and this is a performance, a musical performance where we uh, dress four wind instruments for um, musicians that need air in, uh, in a costume that um, is made out of air filtering material. So as the music is produced, as they breathe in the air, they also clean uh, the air. And it speaks to sort of an awareness, a bodily awareness in a way of, of the environment that we inhabit and our role within that. And in, in spaces, um, and in the beginning, we did some um, um, in, interiors. Uh, this is an, a, a Logan. It's actually an a, a LA-based office that came to, to New York. Um, they, they didn't have full-time staff. They only worked with freelancers. And so uh, we wanted to create an environment where people became aware of the other uh, in the space, even if it is not your colleague. The walls are scrims, and you sort of see uh, a body moving. You realize you're not alone without necessarily having to, to notice this stranger that works um, with you for a while in the same uh, space. And so we've been thinking a lot about that layering and how can we create sort of an added dimension um, to, the, to the surfaces that we are asked to, to deal with. This was a, a reenactment of the Strada Novissima um, when uh, in, in the Hong Kong Shenzhen uh, Biennale, uh, where we were asked to make a scrim with behind it our, our work, and we made a, a colonnade, but actually one that sort of is, a, is an endless um, um, space through reflection and uh, refraction. And so that thinking of these layerings, we, we, we think about and we have been able to sort of increase um, in, in scale as well, a project we recently did in, in Hong Kong. And maybe um, the thinking through, you know, how can we activate that layer, that, that uh, layer between public and private, between the institution uh, and the street, um, you know, inside uh, and outside hot and, and cold um, for a storefront um, designed by uh, Vito Aconci and, and Stephen Hall, a beautiful gallery I'm sure everybody knows in New York City that already in its installation sort of highlights that tension, right? As the gallery wall opens, it, it pushes the institutional space in the street and it invites the street uh, in. When we, when we were asked to, uh, to do an installation in winter, we decided to winterize it like you do with your boat or helicopter. Uh, and so we, we could keep the doors open uh, and actually see and show uh, that depth. And so that, that layering, the, the, the space right there between um, sort of what we can quantify um, and what we can't quantify. And that's where we, we try to operate. Um, sometimes in, in the wall, sometimes in the section, sometimes in the roof, um, sometimes um, uh, as, as temporary uh, installations and sometimes as something permanent, like here, um, not far up north at the, at the UC Davis uh, Maria Melody Shrimp uh, Museum. And so I wanted to talk about depth um, today. Um, and talk through a few projects um, in depth, literally, um, but also um, as sort of a thought to um, um, yeah, dive into um, uh, as, a, as an architectural task uh, today. Um, and I will start with a project that maybe some people have seen before, but I think it's very good at illustrating this idea of the opportunity of, of finding that space between the, the, the sort of the space that needs to um, generate um, and, and is part of uh, contemporary uh, realities, uh, the market, etc., and and the experiences that we can um, uh, offer, um, and we have been um, interested also in the possibility of form as something enigmatic. And so this project is sited um, in a, in, a, in the historic downtown of uh, of Seoul, uh, Korea. It's a gallery space. Actually, where you see those houses is, is where the site um, is. Um, and there's a little stream that, that streams uh, oh, um, under the site. Uh, but currently, it has been um, occupied by, by a series of um, uh, Hanok uh, homes, homes that um, uh, used to be part of the, the palace here on the left. And, and gradually, over time, it has turned into sort of a, um, a residential uh, neighborhood, an arts neighborhood, uh, small boutiques, uh, coffee shops, uh, etc. And we were asked. Um, by uh, a gallery, Kukche Gallery, which means international um, in, in Korean. Uh, they bring uh, Korean artists to the world and the world um, into, um, into um, Seoul uh, to build their third space. And the brief um, for an art space is very simple, make the biggest box possible um, uh, without anything in it, because ultimately that's sort of this neutral space in which art can be sold. And you see 
uh, the gallery K3 there on the right. Um, but as mentioned, this is a beautiful and historic um, neighborhood, and it has a really refined uh, texture. And so the, the, the struggle we dealt with, the, the question we had is how do we deal with this box, that box that is um, you know, ubiquitous, universal, doesn't have character, is neutral, and can function for the function of the gallery. Um, how do we insert that in that very sensitive uh, and um, yeah, uh, textured uh, context? And so we started to think, what are the ele other elements that we need? And rather than having them sort of um, integrated and shoved into um, that wall, into that layer, we pushed it out and we, we tried to work with those things to give it character. And it became quite a diagrammatic and, um, and sort of expressive um, element. But we realized it was maybe too harsh and too, um, uh, too diagrammatic and too um, yeah, hard, in a way, um, to, to, uh, um, uh, for, the, for that context. And as we flew uh, to um, Korea, we were very busy. Uh, this is a very early project. We were teaching. We had two kids. Uh, we, uh, we, we, I, I grabbed a, a stocking and we wrapped it around uh, the model um, with this idea that could we turn this diagram into something that is much more of a sort of permanent uh, fog. Um, um, Miss Lee is a busy lady. She has a Dolce Gabbana black blouse and a big wraparound glasses. She came to the meeting. Uh, she had two minutes for the meeting. She took down her glasses. She said, I like it, make it. <laughs> that was it. That was our first uh, job. Um, and we had to make it, but we had no idea what it was. Um, we hadn't thought about what it was or what it would be. We realized it needed to be pliable, it needed to be soft, but also it needed to withstand um, you know, uh, typhoons and snow. Uh, it needed to be strong. And so we didn't want to construct this form. You know, Often we learn in school to make a form and then figure out how to you know, and then construct it, sort of make that form out of, out of panels or, or other layers. It needed to have depth, it needed to have a certain transparency, and we, we ended up in the, in the Met, um, and we came across um, this uh, figure, or the idea of chain mail, and, and as you can see, it's used for, um, on the scale of the body for people who uh, believe they live in a different era. It's also used for um, belly dancing attire, butcher gloves, um, and what have you. But it is designed really to protect the body and at the same time take on the pliability, right, in the organic sort of nature of the body. Um, and it is, uh, it is elastic in a way. It is sort of so pliable because of the way the rings um, aggregate. And so we started to figure out how does that actually work, right? We bought a sample and we realized there's two directions to it. In one direction it is stiff and flat, and in the other direction it can stretch. And we also um, started to figure out what is the scale um, of the building rather than the body. It only exists and can only be produced or until um, sort of um, you can buy basically it on the scale of the body, but not uh, on any other scale. And so we started to make these things um, in the office out of cardboard. Uh, and at some point, we, 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 we defined sort of what the right size was. And we engaged um, with uh, an engineer, a friend of ours, uh, Mike Ra from Front. Um, and he started to play first with sort of the force in one and then with the, 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 the surface as a whole. And we were able to model it um, on, on, um, uh, digitally and start to see where is the tension within the, within the fabric. We build a, a model um, to check that as well. This is the largest scale. You can buy these rings when they're machine made. Um, but, you know, obviously it was a tenth scale of what the, what the building needed to be. And so then we, uh, then we decided that we should figure out how to make it ourselves because this is not something you can, can buy. Um, and we went to, to, um, to Alibaba.com. And uh, Alibaba wasn't so big at that moment uh, yet, um, but immediately some people jumped up and we started to Skype with people who said, we can do this. Um, and a lot of um, uh, the, the factories and the, the, the place that we heard with was a place in uh, Anping, uh, China, which is about six hours um, south of, uh, of Beijing. We flew there at some point after we had received the sample that looked promising. Uh, we ended up in this town. There's nothing there um, with regards to civil uh, infrastructure. It's really just shops and people making things. And there we found uh, one boy who was welding these rings uh, together by hand. Um, uh, and that's where the sample came from. It was the brother from Ring, the lady who had found us on Skype. Uh, Ring is there in the back. Um, this is Mike Brower, our engineer. This is Jing uh, explaining to the, to the owner that we need half a million rings uh, welded together. And the guy left is not sure that we can do it. Um, <laughs> so we, um, but we, stayed, we stayed in that place. There was no uh, hotel, only the brothel was where we could actually stay. We stayed there for two weeks. Um, and we, um, we, 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 we developed a method. Um, of how to fabricate this um, at scale. And so collectively, 
uh, with the town, we, we figured out a, a, a manufacturing process and a making process, and we used um, a local um, you know, shop to, to clean and the schoolyard to make a mock-up. Um, and after approval by the locals, um, and in the meantime, in um, Korea, they had started construction on the building, uh, we shipped everything. We found uh, people who work in the harbor with, with netting and nets uh, to help us uh, install. And so in some way, it was like catching a whale, maybe you could say, but we, we dressed um, um, the, 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 the box, the diagram, um, uh, attached it from the top, attached it from the, from the bottom. And there, um, uh, we, we were able to create this, uh, this simple diagram in a way, but with a certain yeah, deeper edge, right? An edge uh, that can be moved through, that can be experienced, uh, it takes you th into the building, it takes you down um, to the lower level and up to the roof, um, the elevator and the mechanical unit also pushes out. So um, we, 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 we made the universal white gallery the place um, where art can be shown in its best way possible with daylight uh, from above, uh, always changing. Actually, I was there in October with a beautiful uh, Anish uh, Kapoor um, show. Um, but we also think about what is the relationship to the outside. We always try to find peaks into the context so that you know where you are. Uh, this is the lower level, but most importantly, is, of course, is that experience of moving through that layer, not sure where is inside uh, and outside and where is the, the in-between um, space. So that's the wall for depth. And maybe one um, that's quite literal. And I wanted to talk now about a, a project we recently finished, and that's maybe much more about going um, deep into time and also into the into the ground. Um, a project it says 2020, but it's actually sort of an ongoing project that maybe started two two centuries or actually three centuries ago um, in northern France, a town called uh, Meissenthal, um, and when you find uh, an old postcard uh, of this town, it's a bucolic town, one would say, um, in uh, uh, a beautiful um, region, um, the Vogesen. And um, what is interesting about this postcard um, is that the church is not in the center of the town, right? Um, but the factory is. So this is a factory town. This is not a traditional town. At the heart of this uh, town is, is a glass uh, factory. Um, and this region um, is very, uh, has a long, long history of glass uh, making. Um, it works because the, the, the wood that is there provides good fire, the soil that is there um, is necessary uh, as one of the um, ingredients. There's water and there's the air of the humans that blow it into, the, um, into this alchemical process. And so uh, in the Middle Ages, this was an important place for, for glass making. And it, it was actually a family, um, a sort of a family secret. Um, uh, the people that knew the secret of making glass, they, they, they kept it within the family and they were nomadic. They moved through the forest and they, um, they blew glass, but it was sort of considered magic right at that time. Uh, and at some point it became um, even something that the, the rulers were uh, worried about. And so although there had been a history in the forests here of nomadic glass blowing, at some point it was shut down and it took this man, um, <coughs> Leopold the Good, um, to reinstate the relationships with those glass uh, blowing families, really sort of almost cults, um, to, to start a place here uh, in Meissenthal. And uh, it was the two brothers, uh, Walter, who started uh, gradually a production studio on this uh, site and ran uh, sort of a, a, about two centuries ago. Um, and this place, it grew uh, over time. There were some important um, artists that, that came to the Came to this uh, uh, town, um, uh, a famous um, Art, Art Nouveau uh, uh, designer, Emile Galli, was there. Uh, and it's also known as the place where the Christmas ornament was actually um, invented. And I won't go deeper into that history because it's a long history. Um, but it's to say that the, the, the essence of this town is this production uh, of glass. It's both its physical um, heritage, also its cultural uh, heritage. But if you think of that, um, and this is the site of our of our project, um, it's not a, a monument uh, in that sense. It is 
uh, a material assembly that has been changing uh, very uh, pragmatically over time. It's a technical building, and as sort of technologies evolved, um, and as sort of new insights were produced, the, the building adjusted and shifted and, and changed. So there's, it was growing and shrinking. And so in the 70s, this, um, this factory went um, uh, bankrupt. Um, the, the, it closed. There was different uh, processes, and it was sort of left uh, abandoned. It's a small town, as you can imagine. There's about 500 homes. Um, and so they, they, had this, they had this large um, uh, center of the town with these big buildings. Um, and it was the teenagers, they started to use the, the hall up there to, to do concerts. There were still some people blowing glass in that building up there to the right. There was a little museum with some money from the local municipality to show sort of the history of this place. Um, but for the rest, it was, it was quite, um, um, there were ruins and it was sort of somewhat uh, abandoned and, and quiet. Um, and so the competition was actually to bring these three organizations together in a new um, organization to give it sort of new uh, vitality, literally to breathe in new air um, into this space, um, make it into a single uh, address, so to say, and destination, uh, indeed stimulate maybe tourism and other um, new actors to come uh, into this place, um, have a centralized visitor experience, and, and just sort of unify um, these three entities that have been operating completely separate without really talking to each other. And so this idea of how to bring these um, separate elements together under a single um, you know, of on a sort of blanket was one of the of the ideas, um, and another idea had actually to do with this idea of the molten uh, earth, if you want. If you think of glass, uh, and it is obvious to um, when you when you design um, a glass pavilion, for instance, to make it out of glass, um, like in Toledo. But in this case, we um, we thought differently about thinking what it means to design uh, with or for glass. And we thought of the, the earth, the, 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 these layers right, of time, in a way, the sediment of time that was present on this site, to think about that um, uh, as sort of an architectural uh, impulse and think through how do we, you know, in this um, yeah. Yeah, layering of time, do we, do we insert another ground, a ground uh, where these three um, uh, different organizations can come uh, uh, together. Um, and so this, this idea of the, the NAP, as it's called in French, uh, was born, this idea of a continuous ground uh, in which these three different organizations uh, can uh, be together on a common ground. And we re-scribed in a way the, the, the yard of the factory, which used to be the, the center of town, as a new place for events uh, and activities. Um, and then just lifting the landscape slightly, uh, to create a new space over the ruins um, so that within the ruins there could be a visitor a workshop a, a cafe and, and an education space and it was sort of a very clear and diagrammatic um, um, solution which sometimes works when you do a, a competition uh, but there was another aspect that was important for us in the thinking through um, um, uh, the scheme which is sort of the material reality um, of these buildings uh, and the constant sort of tinkering and the sort of ad hoc approach that people had had to working with these buildings. These are not uh, cathedrals or, or palaces, but they are just, you know, uh, assemblies of, of matter, so to say, that can change and shift over time. And when you, when we were there um, before the intervention, the, the layering, right, of different materials, just things that are available and a sort of pragmatism um, that we could have um, uh, as an approach as well. And so we, we came up with a sort of a technique um, of adding, removing, filling in, um, scraping, um, and, 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 and transforming um, as techniques that we could use in, in doing the, the architectural uh, interventions. Also, um, it needed to happen because of funding over a relatively long period of time. Actually, we spent about eight years um, on this project as funding became available. And so not every space was done at the same time, not, ever, not even necessarily by the same uh, contractor. And so here you see the different types of interventions that, that happened. Um, it's in French, uh, but basically we added the black box um, theater into the large uh, hall. We added two glass making studios up there. Uh, we completely renovated the museum and we added the, the visitor uh, center. Um, and so this project, which also went through COVID um, as, um, um, you know, as a process with regards to uh, uh, building it, which, which certainly has, a, has an um, effect on it, you know, it was sort of a, 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 an act of strategic uh, removal 
careful um, excavation. We completely remade a uh, continuous um, new basement under these buildings, so a very complex sort of um, uh, uh, undertaking, so to say. Um, and then the constructing of this uh, nap uh, that creates that new ground, and in some ways sort of a new uh, topography and a new um, underworld, if you want, as well. And we thought it was very important speaking about the experience, that you're able to navigate between the sort of upper level and the lower level and go in the catacomba of the museum, but also up all the way uh, and have new uh, perspectives on, uh, on the site. So here you see uh, the lower level. Uh, for the, for the uh, performance space on the left, we added uh, an entrance and, and uh, dressing rooms and a, and a bar and, and uh, toilets and what have you uh, to serve the theater that we inserted. Um, new glass making facility, uh, the entrance to the museum and here the visitor and the bookshop and cafe at the, at, the, at the bottom and there in one of the old buildings the archive with all the um, historic Christmas ornaments um, from centuries uh, stored uh, and then above this new ground where the three institutions can still have their own sort of presence and their own address and their own uh, communication but still sort of unified um, on this new uh, new insertion and so when you come to the to the building and when you come to the town you you have to drive, it's actually really hard. Uh, it takes, even from Paris, still four hours. It's like a real um, uh, pilgrimage, if you want. Uh, and, and you see this somewhat messy town with all these elements, and suddenly you realize something awkward is, uh, is there, uh, or some new um, uh, addition, new layer that starts to sort of uh, insert itself and is embedded uh, within this uh, um, uh, small um, rural uh, town. Uh, and then you can slide under under the ground. At some point, there's an opening, um, and you experience, in a way, the weight um, of that of that ground as you as you come in and you come into the into this courtyard, um, the the old uh, factory yard. Uh, and you can look all the way uh, around the entrance. You can move. You can go up uh, a new uh, perspective. And we thought a lot about sort of what does it mean to be sort of under that layer and above um, that layer, and how. Um, is, does that create sort of a new um, experience? Um, and with um, sort of this continuous ground, um, it's, it's indeed all of the um, institutions they share uh, and have become uh, accessible. Uh, so here's the, the, the old ruins, which became the, the, um, the, the store and the information uh, center. There's a little education room uh, upstairs um, and the old and the new uh, coming together. Um, and when you move on, a new entrance uh, and a new uh, basement for the, the one historic uh, building, which needed, which is landmark, which is the old uh, factory building or the old museum building. I'll talk about that later. You enter through a tunnel uh, into sort of the underground. There's a video. You move up through the building, um, through the layers and the um, yeah, all the work that has been done. And what we did uh, when we came there for the first time, we, we realized there's a very beautiful structure, this roof structure, which is quite a unique way of building um, a vault, um, which was invented by this uh, gentleman, um, Zollinger, um, which is basically a reciprocal structure where short pieces of wood can create this sort of beautiful vaulted ceiling. When we were there, it was all covered up and it was not supposed to be for the, for the public. Uh, but we sort of insisted that we make that part of the experience as well. And, uh, open it up. We we re-roofed it with insulation on the outside, and actually we we introduced daylight um, through uh, through opening up windows right there uh, in the in the structure. And so from that upper level, you can move um, to the glass making um, studios uh, where we uh, opened up a, a, a section, and you can see the the glass making. There's glass education. They have artists that they invite um, to talk about um, work. This is actually really interesting artist who uses the very, very traditional ways uh, of blowing glass in the forest um, and, and works their own new, new pieces. So it became a very um, vibrant and, and real serious destination for artists uh, working in glass. And so the history um, continues um, and keeps on uh, continuing. And so what was interesting here also as an architect is not necessarily thinking about sort of old and new, uh, but really sort of just a small layer um, added uh, to this endless um, Sort of uh, evolving um, site, um, the 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 combination of, of structures and textures. Um, I will end uh, this project with um, the the black box theater that we introduced. This hall, which is used for contemporary art, but also for uh, events. We inserted this this box, uh, but these doors can open, and so sometimes it's a black box uh, only 
you know, for a scale of this completely um, insulated and perfect for small type uh, events and, and gatherings. Uh, but then the back can open up and there can be a large uh, concert for 5,000 people because these teenagers, they grew up and they uh, were able to get more people to come to their, to their events. Um, and so, and uh, this, it's, yeah, um, it was a, a journey, so to say, it took, uh, it took eight years and, and it's interesting to continue to see how uh, time and layers of time will be added to this, uh, to this uh, town. Um, I'm trying to show a lot of work, so I'm trying to go a little bit fast. Um, Amant, we also finished uh, this year. This is a different type of uh, depth. This is on the depth of the of the of the urban block, if you want. Uh, Brooklyn, um, East Williamsburg or Bushwick, um, industrial sites. Um, a lot of artists um, now. Some restaurants, um, breweries. I think you can imagine people must have been there. Um, and you see from the urban fabric, you see how these boxes literally are optimized, right? They fill out their entire site. Uh, they're there to generate income. They're there for production. They are um, yeah, productive buildings. Um, the blocks are uh, closed. There's no uh, porosity. The streets are um, very industrial. There's some residential left there, uh, but generally, you know, buildings uh, to generate um, income. Um, we were asked by um, uh, uh, Lonti Ebers, uh, uh, our client, uh, who was concerned that uh, it would be uh, increasingly hard for artists to be and spend time uh, in New York to design the space where artists could be, literally. They didn't have to produce anything. Um, it was uh, the idea of offering uh, an address for a period of time so that they could be in the city, they could meet people, they could do maybe work, they could maybe show work, they can have conversations, but it didn't matter, you were welcome. Um, you have to apply and you can stay for a while in this place. And so in some way, an oasis within this uh, quite um, industrial area. Uh, one of the buildings was an old um, stone uh, cutter uh, and, um, and sort of um, uh, yeah, tile store. Um, th this is the back of it. Uh, it's, a, it's a shop. Actually, Joy Wu, people know Joy Wu, no? Used to work for Morphosis. She lives next door. Um, <laughs> Uh, and the, on the other side is the mini storage. Um, and uh, the other building on the back was a, here you see, was an existing um, warehouse um, which was removed um, before, we, before we worked on the, on the project. Um, and so here we, we started to think much more about sort of how can we have a, a deeper experience within the block itself in order to create um, uh, some quality uh, some some uh, human scale, if you want, uh, some sort of place of comfort. We we realize we need to move people from the street. There's a there's a kitchen uh, abattoir, uh, you know, one block up. There's a, 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 a truck storage, but basically the streets are not very welcoming. And so the idea um, uh, uh, became to draw people deep into the block and have the experience and have the places actually be sort of as far into the block um, as possible. So here plan. And section, it's four buildings in total. I'll take you through. This is the existing um, tile cutter. This is a very busy street, Grand Street. This is a little bit less busy street, Mojo Street. Um, this became uh, a gallery space at an entrance, a uh, bookshop and cafe at the heart with a, with a courtyard that we introduced, um, a gallery building uh, with offices above. Uh, this is the residency building. So it's not residency in, in the fact that they live there, but they have studio space, they have a kitchen, they can stay here, there's showers and everything. For zoning, we couldn't put a bed in there, but who knows. Um, but generally, four studios uh, above and a sort of shared communal kitchen and sort of um, reading and relaxed room over there. And then a most public sort of event space deep into the block so that when the audiences and when the people would come in, they would be sort of pulled into the into the street. And here you see it as sort of a model um, in, the, in the context um, as well. Um, but as we know, um, art boxes, they want to be uh, big and they want to be enclosed. Um, and so in the scale of these industrial buildings, we were trying to figure out how do we create a more intimate scale for the, for the bodily experience within this more pedestrian um, 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 network, I should say. Um, this is really a new shortcut through the block all the way through. And remember this window because you'll see it in, in a little bit, but we thought a lot about sort of how do we, you know, how do you experience this, this fabric also physically. And so we, we decided to, well, the other challenge was we we're doing four buildings at the same time, uh, but they can't look all the same, but they can't 
look all completely different either. So we had to sort of figure out a method or an approach to, to see what is the affinities between these buildings? Is it a language? Is it a family? How do we, how do we deal with them? And so we established a series of very quite simple uh, rules. One is every building has a horizontal datum, um, and that datum is a, a material change or a texture uh, change to an extent. Um, the other thing is we use certain elements to create particularity, to cre give the building some um, sort of personality and expression. For instance, uh, a big sort of balcony here or the, the art space that pushes out. Um, and the last thing we decided was to work only with materials we could find uh, within a mile and a half um, radius. Um, so it, it is a, a site of production. There is, you know, a stone yard nearby. There's a lot of metal manufacturing and luckily there was actually a cement plant down the down the block but so it was not you know it's not that we were um, far out where it was sort of limiting our palate but we said let's work with the texture and the material of the of the neighborhood um, and we started actually um, not so much with um, designing uh, but much more with sort of testing what we could do and how could we introduce um, that those textures and materialities um, to to these buildings so we started really working through through mock-ups uh, we worked with a mason who worked on our house before Harry here on, le on the left to make sort of to test we found a brick that is quite interesting it is like um, rough on two sides and soft on two other sides um, so how can we use that to play with its uh, expression and, and produce sort of a series of, of textures that we could use um, another use of brick the standard brick is extruded along a die it has this sort of pattern of, um, uh, of scores that you normally don't see because they're at the back of the brick they're hidden um, we flip the brick and suddenly you, you create a texture uh, where you don't see anymore what the, where the brick sort of begins uh, and ends by giving the grout the same color um, as the brick. And so this is sort of a very um, yeah, trial and error uh, approach towards figuring out sort of how to craft and how to work with these materials and actually work really with the, um, yeah, with the, with the, the contractors on site instead of creating this much more um, um, expressive and maybe uh, textured uh, um, uh, palette of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 uh, of materiality. Um, for the ground, because that's one of the things that unifies uh, these buildings, we wanted to give people uh, even a sort of a, a sensorial experience as you move from the standard city sidewalk in New York to the ground here. And so we, we made a custom sort of rake uh, and raked um, the, 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 the walkways and uh, the in-between spaces in this sort of textured uh, pattern. So actually, maybe sub sometimes subconsciously, as you as you cross the threshold, you feel that you are in a different uh, in a different space. Um, and so I will take you through um, this opened. Uh, it's two years. We have two years anniversary just uh, recently. Um, that's the old uh, existing building, the the new arts building, the um, studio building, and the and the. The, the black box. Um, this is from the busy street and this layering again thinking about just that relationship between the, the, the sidewalk and the art space here we sort of you know negotiated that through an exterior uh, courtyard and sort of an interior lobby and then a small uh, step up into um, the gallery. There is ADA access from the other side but here we um, had this existing difference because of the, the building that existed but it also creates sort of an interesting just one step into the into the art space itself, which again um, is neutral, is flexible, can be um, used in different ways. There's no collection shown. There's a director who curates uh, shows. There's always changing shows. It's quite good. I would recommend you to come and see. Um, we kept some of the skylights. We reoriented them so there's northern uh, lights, but they can be uh, closed off uh, as well. And as you move back into the sort of circulation spaces, the materiality comes back. Um, and the, the textures uh, come back. Um, here are the bookshop and the cafe, which is open um, uh, throughout the, the week and became really a place where people uh, enjoy uh, working in this, uh, in this courtyard um, here on the right, uh, facing the other building, um, which is the arts building with the offices above, a brick below, aluminum grating uh, above. These are the, the offices. One double high space to bring in uh, daylight um, filtered through the through the grating as a clear story, um, which actually at night it's not here in the picture gives sort of a, a, a gentle shimmering through the through the mesh and indicates that something is is happening there. Uh, and opposite the street, uh, in a little nod to Lina Bobardi, um, all the way through the alley you can see it from the busy street of Grand Street at night. It sort of shines and it draws you um, to the studio space. The studio space which is actually really a private space. Um, 
um, the general audience um, is not necessarily invited into the studios, but is invited around it. So there's two sideways you can you can pass by. Uh, the ground floor has a, a sort of um, a shared dining uh, room here around the corner with the kitchen, and there on the side uh, a reading room. And there we use a, a similar texture, but in this case out of felt to make a very soft and completely acoustically um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, encompassing uh, environment, which is being used uh, for artists to gather and to to brain, yeah, to 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 think, discuss, and uh, produce and think about uh, ideas. Um, and that space then juts into the into the courtyard, which is used for uh, programming and events. Uh, the students can spill out, uh, or the the artists use the space for. For, um, for gathering, but also the audience comes in, they come, uh, if there is a public event deep into that uh, space in the back, which is a very flexible space used for um, uh, a variety of um, activities and also hosts um, neighborhood um, initiatives and programs. So there's like a book fair or other activities that, the, that this uh, institution is welcoming the, the community and to use the, the space. Um, I keep going, right? Okay. Um, because now we're going to talk about some housing and uh, and, and depth, so to say, um, in in the domestic experience. Mm. And we started with a project in Mexico, um, also finished during um, COVID, um, 2021. Uh, this was a relatively fast project, and we were invited uh, to a town, uh, Leon, um, to deal in a way with this problem, or not solve this problem, but actually think through how um, this could be done differently. Housing in um, Mexico um, is a big deal. It's a very large population. 50% of the population uh, lives in uh, informal um, settlements, which is self-built. Uh, also, neighborhoods really grown you know, over time, um, but not, so to say, within the system. Right? Uh, and so the, the, the government has a program called Infonavit, which is like the Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, of Mexico, which is basically you can get a mortgage if you um, if you live in a certain uh, home, you have to apply. But this is sort of a, a journey into home ownership. The way these conditions are uh, written and the way um, sort of this this system works, it produces endless um, worlds like this one, um, which are ground connected, very simple construction. Um, homes um, on the you know on, on lots but these lots are typically the cheapest lots that are, uh, are available and they're very far out from uh, the city centers and they produce this landscape of um, that, are, that are so far removed from sort of the economic hearts of the of the um, of some of the cities that for the mayors it becomes very hard to keep up with that um, with with this type of urbanization and so they, they can't get services there they can't get trash pickup they can't get schools they can't get transportation, they can get um, 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 uh, security there. And so often the, a lot of these neighborhoods are being left uh, abandoned. Um, and so we were asked by the, um, the city of Leon, um, which you see here in the project that we're, I'm going to talk about is here at the bottom right. Uh, Leon is one of the fastest growing uh, cities in Mexico and the mayor um, um, acknowledged, he said it's also probably the ugliest city in Mexico. Um, it's growing very quickly because it is attracting a lot of migrant laborers because all the jobs that used to be in Detroit are now um, in uh, Leon. A lot of car factories, and you see a Ford factory there in the back, uh, have moved here. And so it's one of the uh, fastest growing migrant labor um, cities in, uh, yeah, in, uh, in, in the Americas. And, and a lot of informal housing happening right around these, these factories. And so the, the ask was, um, can you come up with a typology that is for this uh, demographic, for this price point, um, but that is denser, that is closer into the um, urban core, so to say. And it means, can we imagine vertical living for uh, a population that is used to build uh, um, informally on the ground and has uh, community life um, on uh, the ground? And so the question of verticality, but at the same time thinking about sort of the, the connection to um, community and to the ground was one of the questions, and it needed to happen at a very, very, very e efficient budget, um, 60 units for two and a half million uh, dollars. Um, and so the most effective way to build in diagram, if you see um, here on the left, is to make the same box um, with as little circulation space as possible, because the box um, is uh, where the value is and the 
corridor, the double loaded core, that's where you, where, where who no, no, nobody pays for that, right? So, so this is the most common type, and I'm sure you're familiar with this type because it's everywhere in this country um, as well. Um, it does create an extremely um, limited um, and, and a reductive experience, right? Specifically, if you think about the relationship between street and street life and community life and your home. Um, since the climate was very um, uh, mild there, uh, and since we um, were not climatizing this building, actually, uh, there's no uh, AC. It needed to be naturally cooled and naturally ventilated. Uh, the, the courtyard, as an as a, as a, um, opportunity, uh, arose so we could have uh, cross, cross ventilation, ventilation and you can have an open walkway that didn't need to be uh, enclosed. And, and then we wanted to give it a certain particularity and a certain um, um, uh, identity because if you live in collective housing, um, uh, it's it's sometimes nice to know where where you live. Um, it was um, on uh, on a corner, so we we thought it would be interesting to give sort of a, a presence to the corner, but then break the the building down in sort of smaller. Part so that you could at least sort of uh, recognize where uh, you know what is the what is the sections that say of where you, where your home uh, is. We did this relatively quickly. We visited uh, a lot of the um, sites. We actually visited a lot of people in the neighborhoods. We had a lot of conversations. We worked with the, the housing authority um, there, which is uh, literally a, a municipal department run by by architects. But we collaborated with them. They did the construction drawings and really through a very sort of um, integral. Um, project uh, or process we came to this building um, organized around two courtyards with an entrance there right uh, around uh, the corner. Um, and so the walkways are exterior. You see here the, the units uh, are all facing these courtyards. There's in the center uh, uh, a staircase and an elevator, but there's also a secondary staircase that wraps actually um, uh, around the building and takes you up uh, along uh, some of these open spaces. Let me see if the mouse works. Um, no. Interesting. Well, you see there with the hatch. So some of the apartments we left out, and the, these are collective spaces where people can gather and um, uh, and, and, and sort of um, fun, like do their own um, uh, activities. Um, and so yeah, you see that also a little bit in this diagram. Um, what is the challenge at the moment that you have cross ventilation and you have a single loaded corridor is that people start peeking into your uh, apartment. And so we, we had the idea, um, um, also very simple construction, to work with one um, uh, window type and a precast uh, uh, concrete uh, element that makes sort of an accordion type uh, facade so that you can have only sort of oblique um, 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 peaks into, uh, into the home and light comes in sort of uh, on the oblique uh, as well. It also creates depth uh, to create some shading uh, because there is sun that comes in. And so pulling the facade a little bit back from the uh, from the edge of slab was a good uh, idea. And so we made this image um, and we said this is the design um, and we suggested precast panels and um, the, the housing, the, the, the people we were working with, they said it's great. Um, we, and we said we want to see a mock-up and then it became a little bit difficult and a little bit quiet and at some point. I, and you know, sometimes it was quiet, we didn't know what was happening. And then we asked, uh, can we see a mock-up? And he said, well, here's the mock-up. Um, <laughs> Is on the right is the precast panel. I think you don't cast precast like this, right? You would um, put it flat, and you would anyway. Uh, and and they said, but what about this on the left, right? I said, well, that's nice, but you know, we wanted, we wanted, we were thinking of. I said, we did another. They did another one, um, and then they said, you know what? One precast panel has to come from six hours away. There's one company that can do it. Um, he has the truck. We need a crane. Uh, there's one guy with a crane uh, to install one panel on site. We can have 30 people work for 30 days. And wouldn't it be better if the people that might be living in this building actually participate in the constructing of this building? And sort of wouldn't it be good to offer them work rather than this one person who has all the tools? Um, as you said, that's a very good point. Um, and so we learned that um, per um, labor law in Mexico, the maximum one person can carry is 17 uh, kilos. Uh, so we said, let's make that panel, but let's make the wall out of a block, a custom block, a simple block that weighs exactly 17 uh, kilos. We actually needed two because one was the straight wall and one was the hinge because as you saw, it was sort of a undulating uh, harmonica type um, shaped uh, wall. Uh, the windows there are 90 degrees, right? The window doesn't like to hinge, it needs to have a straight edge. So we designed there in black, um, a sort of 
uh, pentagon, pentagonal shape, but actually all the corners are irregular, which means there's always some sort of setting where it would click in. Um, and this uh, allowed sort of this built this this panel uh, along the the curvilinear uh, wall. So we did a we did a mock up again, and here you see sort of how it worked along that wall, which also meant we didn't really have to make uh, construction drawings anymore about every single um, element. What we did is we scored an offset from the edge of slab, um, and we just asked the, the the mason to start you know putting block, and when they hit that line, put in a hinge, um, and then you know put in the distance of a window and start again. And so that created a very you know, organic and much more fluid sort of uh, texture um, of the wall, um, much less trying to push for a certain order or a certain grid or a certain you know, alignment, but actually allowing the process itself to become sort of the expression um, of the building. Uh, and in that, sort of, it, it, you know, it, it became a much more rich um, texture and a much more, um, I would say, soft um, maybe uh, appearance uh, on on that on that corner, and so here you see it in in the context. There immediately sort of the market sort of forms um, around it. It's very quite busy on that on that corner, uh, this corner over here. Um, uh, but then you come in through the through the courtyard, uh, and there are the the walkways. We were able to save some budget for for landscape as well. And actually, it really works um, very well um, as a place for you know to naturally um, um, ventilate. It's very cool. There is um, thermal mass in the in the building itself that holds the the the, the cold of the of the day or of the night, and so it's a very agreeable, very shaded, very comfortable and pleasant um, space. And and these spaces actually also contribute to helping with the the flow um, uh, here in the. Uh, in the context, um, the the city fixed a, a, a park that was there, and so that's um, used by the new uh, inhabitants. And generally, a very um, yeah, uh, it was for us a very incredible experience actually working on this on this project. Um, and also, it allowed us to to indeed challenge maybe some of these norms of what is you know what is value, so to say, and what is effective and what is efficient. Um, so we took that recently um, to uh, a few projects we're doing in, in Brooklyn um, with Sam Main, the son of Tom Main, yes, um, and Seba, they will show up later, two guys, uh, well, one is almost an architect and the other is an architect, um, but they became developers and they understand maybe how you can think differently also about um, residential and we, we try to do something very different from what is the norm um, you know in um, in the US in many places the most effective way right to come to your house is this this is where there's no um, investment so to say in the shared space um, only in the finishes and in the bathrooms um, and also we uh, and this became clear in the last period more than ever we thought a lot about so what is that relationship to the city and what is that relationship we have you know, between our home, our intimate domestic space, and the and the city and urban uh, life. As you saw, uh, this is the site. This is downtown Brooklyn over there. There's big, you know, rezoning, so a lot of new big buildings. Ginny Gang, Shop, uh, everybody. Uh, there's Manhattan. Here, NYCHA housing, uh, so uh, housing projects from the 70s, um, and then a landmark brownstone uh, area with beautiful townhouses. And this is the site here uh, on the corner, actually um, bracketed between another. Uh, housing project on the other side of the of the street, um, and so we we thought a lot about what does it mean to to be uh, in the city. Um, people love uh, Brooklyn because of its street life, the stoop as a place as a connector right between the 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 the, the sidewalk and your home. So how can we make the how can we sort of um, make the least efficient building? Maybe no, how can we make the most um, uh, exterior connectivity, the most porous, the most connected type of building? And so we look at the unit itself and, and try to see can we maximize sort of its connectivity then at the, the, the units in relation to one another um, and then the building uh, as, a, as a whole. And so it's a corner side, the most effective way would be to make an L-shaped uh, building with a core in the middle and two double loaded corridors down the two paths. Um, but through looking carefully actually at the zoning and the massing and some of the uh, regulation, we were able to move some of the massing into what would otherwise be uh, the yard, um, and in that way, 
uh, we actually created a much more open, permeable, uh, porous uh, building, which um, with a central open um, uh, uh, um, sort of walkway, uh, rather than a double loaded corridor, allowed all the units to be very, very uh, connected. Uh, balconies don't stick out of the building. They're actually rooms that are um, added on to the home. Uh, and so that adds sort of to the, 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 the reading of it as a as sort of a porous, um, quite densely built um, uh, massing. Uh, here you see um, the, the three individual uh, buildings. In green, the outside walkways that connect those uh, uh, buildings. Uh, and in sort of the blue are all the exterior spaces that these units uh, have. And so we overbuilt, so to say, um, with regards to the gross net um, uh, in the matrix of the of the development, but this is space that sort of it doesn't count to your FAR, but it is actually um, um, space that has value, we believe. Um, and so the exterior balconies uh, and front porches and the walkways are suddenly very uh, open, porous, and uh, enjoyable. So here, um, the, the the building from the from the corner, uh, we worked again with a with a brick, a very simple um, sort of um, uh, aggregate within the brick, but by a slight sort of rotation of the brick, it, it gives it, again, texture, so the expression actually comes from the light rather than from the material um, itself. Uh, you enter right sort of there in the in the middle through this uh, open gate. And maybe this is a more common um, typology uh, in the south or in warmer climates. In, in, in New York, it was pretty um, um, radical to propose this as your, as your journey um, home. Um, and so the walkways, we were able to um, um, stretch this uh, net as a way uh, to uh, prevent people from falling falling down. The, the building inspector said, I, I hate it, um, but I have to approve it. Um, so we uh, we were able to get away with it. We, we, we were anticipating that maybe he would request something, but actually it's, it's and it, it adds really also to sort of this feeling as you move through it. And what is interesting is the, the way this is a shared um, a green space between these uh, buildings. But what is interesting is that because you become aware of not just the people who live you know, on the other side of your double loaded corridor, but actually throughout this building, much quicker uh, community was, was formed. The, one of our clients, um, uh, he moved in. And he said, it's like within uh, two days, I knew everybody in my building. We know who have the, who have the kids, who have the cats, who have the dogs. Um, and so that sort of idea that if you rethink the way you make that journey, you can actually create, you know, a much more strengthened idea of community was, was you know, what we really tried to prove with this building. You also see the sort of front uh, porches um, giving people a little space within this communal space um, where you can, you know, park a stroller or leave your umbrella or put your boots with a bench. So it's sort of this threshold, again, between, you know, these different layers of, uh, of publicness and privateness. And so, you can look into it from the units. The, the balcony um, here is really a room that can be accessed from both the kitchen um, and, the, and the living room, and is sort of integral uh, and can be, you know, uh, used uh, throughout the, the seasons. Um, and as you walk up in this sort of more Pyrenean uh, space, you might encounter other forms of life that are enjoying um, uh, enjoying the outsides. And this wouldn't happen in your corridor, uh, or maybe this. Um, and so here, Sam uh, and, and Seba, uh, Sam uh, on the right, Seba, an architect who used to work for Fosters for 15 years, they are uh, our client, they're called Tank House, uh, and we're working with them um, and continue to work with them. And actually, we're working on two new projects that are almost finished, and I will show a little bit of that, and then one last project, and then we're done. Um, these two are almost finished, but they're based on the same uh, principles. So the first one, at 18 units, this is 24 units, and the one on the right, 34. They all have exterior uh, circulation. We always try to give a very um, dense and rich um, unit mix. So often in um, residential buildings, all the units are the same. What we try to do is create as much sort of variety um, as possible in this uh, puzzle. Um, this is a very small site, as you can see. Uh, we work with the same sort of idea of these uh, uh, balconies as, as rooms. Um, in this case, no central um, court, but actually um, a very uh, compact elevator shaft. And as you come out, um, you still see some enclosure, uh, but then very quickly you go outside, and the, the rest of the route to your home, even on the 14th floor, um, is exterior and is sort of yours and your balcony rather than a, than a corridor. And um, so you see there's only one unit there on the right. Um, and 
that entire walkway could be used and planted. And similarly here, these two people share um, this sort of front open area on the right to the, the front doors. Um, what we also tried to do, this is during uh, COVID, we realized that the, the, the loft, uh, although um, celebrated as the best New York typology, is like the worst way um, to live together uh, during a pandemic um, because everything is happening in the same uh, space. And so what we tried to do here is actually split and, and move away from the singular room. So the living and dining, we sort of stretched apart. And also the bedrooms that are normally bundled around sort of a, a, a shaft, right, where the bathrooms come together, we actually push the bedrooms separate from one another. So when your kid is having singing class, uh, you can still uh, do a lecture or a, a, a Zoom uh, call. Um, and yeah, really thinking about acoustical separation and how do you think about these units. And um, um, again, uh, at least one and sometimes two balconies per, per space. As you see, when the, when the building moves up, the unit mix sort of changes and goes from three units to two units to one unit. Um, and then the layering, so the, the inner layer is something really um, sort of uh, um, cementitious and, and uh, uh, enclosed and an outer sort of much more a porous uh, layer of a perforated uh, aluminum. So these two um, textures coming together, uh, a similar block that, I, that we showed in Mexico here on the right, um, and then a sort of veil on the, on the outside. And this building is almost done as well. It will be, um, you see it here next to the chapel with a sort of view to the, to the park um, and uh, uh, it becoming, uh, this is a recent picture of one of the um, units. Um, so this is almost uh, finished. And the second one, also based on a similar principle here, organized around uh, a courtyard with all exterior walkways that are part of the, the sort of uh, com completion of the, the block, 34 um, units uh, around this yard with, with outside uh, terraces, um, a very dense uh, unit mix that negotiates between two um, uh, zoning districts and so one more commercial street here with retail on the on the on the on the sort of busy uh, Myrtle and then Vanderbilt, which turns into a sort of uh, brownstone type street uh, down, the, uh, down the road. And so you see that here a little bit in scale as well. Again, the busy street over there with uh, commercial spaces and a very open sort of multi-layered uh, lobby entry into this very dense um, green um, courtyard uh, that can be experienced by all the units and the walkways um, that sort of use that also on the, I don't have a plan of the higher levels, but basically you, you circulate around that courtyard to your, to your home. Uh, and a very um, articulate um, uh, facade with porosity in the, in, the, um, in the assembly as well, and actually sort of shifting slabs and shifting uh, sections. This is the, the entrance. You enter sort of through the street level, but then there is sort of this double uh, level lobby uh, that takes you into this um, green uh, uh, garden space that soon will be planted and very um, uh, uh, shared by the by the different uh, units. We, we worked here with precast uh, concrete uh, elements um, which um, interestingly enough have been waiting already for about um, a half a year they've been waiting uh, and are uh, about to be um, installed uh, and so this building it, it's taking a little bit longer but will be by the end of this year. So those three uh, are building on this idea of, of really uh, embracing sort of the the, the overall connection um, with the with the environment around us, and I will end with one project that nobody has seen uh, before because I just got images, but in some way highlight uh, maybe some of the thinking. It's a house for an individual in nature, and this is the first uh, sketch that I did. But this is actually how this person really wants to live. Um, no uh, enclosure uh, in a way at all sort of total um, uh, connectedness to the, to the landscape and to the site. Um, and what is interesting about this project, this is maybe the only drawing uh, that was sort of made um, before um, engaging with the, the site, um, because this is a very particular site and a very particular um, person uh, here with my daughter. Um, and this entire house was sort of designed with tape on uh, the site. Um, he had very um, clear ideas about where he wanted to cook, where he wanted to sleep, where he wanted to um, sit. And so rather than designing it um, on, on paper and then bringing it to the site, the whole house was pretty much designed with tape, uh, very particularly on the site. He also hated 
or hates uh, um, mechanical uh, cooling. And so the idea was that we don't use AC um, at all uh, in this house, but it is you know, a very open uh, uh, home with a lot of glass, so how did we do that? Um, there was a little um, pond at the bottom of this rock, and we decided to move the house all the way to the edge of this rock and actually uh, dig out the pond so that there would be more uh, water there. And there's like this continuous uh, breeze and wind, and so there's actually cool wind coming up the rock um, and, um, and cooling uh, the house. So the house is sort of uh, designed around this uh, flow. This is the way we generated the plan. We flew a drone over the taped um, uh, uh, plan on site and turned that into uh, the drawing and the, the plan of the house, which is really sort of embracing that edge. The, the edge of the rock is here on the, on the north. Um, it's it's uh, west uh, facing, uh, northwest facing in a way. Um, dining and kitchen. He loves to cook. The, he cooks also with a, on, on fire. So there's three fireplaces in the in the in the house, and it's basically sort of a continuous space from sort of the public to more private towards the right. You know, around this uh, this uh, living around this edge of this of this rock, uh, and then just a roof that sort of brings it all together in sort of three um, three pebbles that sort of um, uh, organize these uh, these. Um, the, 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 it's not really rooms, it's sort of a continuous space, but there are some ways to close off certain uh, sections. Um, and so this is a few days ago, um, and just um, came in. And what is interesting is it, it looks very clear with the, with the pond there on the right uh, uh, from the air, but when you arrive to this house, you actually don't really see it um, at once. It, it's sort of you, you walk sort of slowly up the hill and it appears, and then it sort of presents itself um, at that uh, edge. Um, here you see the, the slab and the roof. There's still some landscaping and stuff that needs to happen. That's why um, we're trying to not um, get shared everywhere. There's some soffit that needs to be finished up here, as you see. Um, but you know, the, the, the edge and, the, and the, uh, the, this, the rock coming together in the house sort of embracing this um, this uh, this uh, landscape and <clears throat> yeah some um, images where uh, th this experience of living you know with the with the environment and, and connected to that environment as something that we um, yeah all maybe strive for um, that's it this is our team summer went to school here there in yellow um, maybe people remember her uh, we believe that we can do the best work when we work with many people from many different places who have different viewpoints uh, and different uh, cultural experiences and in that dialogue try to find something that um, we can all uh, to an extent uh, appreciate and enjoy. So thank you. Sure. And then we turn on the light. Yeah, that's fine. Are you going to get one of them? Yeah. Somebody has to start. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much, Bill. This is incredible. Uh, it's nice to see the new projects. And nice to see you actually present some of the old projects. I think we all know them, but the layer of the, the narrative of the project is kind of transforms the house beautiful. Um, you shared an anecdote when you started your presentation about this potential developer talking about efficiency. And I don't know what I'm missing, but I don't see lack of efficiency. <laughs> No. <laughs> no. I mean, um, no. Effectiveness, maybe, but yeah. So no, I am just as interested in that. Uh, like when you're, I, I was interested in hearing you talk about efficiency yeah. and whether you had the chance to reflect because I cannot identify. But what I saw is like intelligent ways to think things like you without necessarily compromising on, you know, a number of units or a certain, uh, I guess, benchmarks that you would use to measure the efficiency of a project. 
uh, that might make some sense for somebody like a developer. Yeah. But it seems that you're accomplishing all of those things and then some using exactly what we are trying to do, which is designed to provide uh, alternatives um, without compromising on that end. So efficiency, does it matter? Uh, uh, to some people it matters, no, but more, I would say, so this, this comes a lot with the, the ratios that certain people think through. It gets very quickly, we're, it can become a real estate class, but <laughs> basically there, there, there are, uh, most designs are first made on an Excel sheet and then they turn into a drawing. Yeah, the maths yeah. the work. And so, for, well, it's interesting. So for instance, the, the, the residential project, uh, the first one we did with, uh, with Seba and Sam, um, they went to the bank to get a loan and the lady at the bank said sorry we, the machine doesn't give us a loan like it doesn't there's nothing comes out and and they put in all the parameters and they put in and so they had to figure out what was wrong in the math and and it turned out there was too much facade per floor area so the so literally it, the system itself did not allow to have this thing be financed um, and so they had to go to family to finance this this building it was it was could not be financed through the regular um, way in what which construction, formulation? because there's too much facade, yeah, there's it, 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 too much exterior, right? All these buildings have, and that's the whole point, it's like we try to really think through what does it mean to be, you know, in touch literally or to engage, and so I think that that produces, tends to produce more surface area. Um, you started with this idea of a modernist legacy, um, and I, I wanted to ask you about the transition of the modernist legacy and then how it kind of has evolved in your firm. It seems like from the projects from the beginning is kind of very true to the modernist legacy in terms of like the cleanness, um, and then as your projects progress, it seems like there's some um, material expression, tectonic expression, um, also relationships to a social building and how that then transforms your work uh, as well as color starts to starts to pour into your work. So can you talk about that transition of the, the kind of modernist legacy that kind of maybe uh, was very heavy part of your work in the beginning and then the translation to that in the kind of 21st century um, kind of different uh, forces that now act on your work in as the yeah. your voice as architect. That's a very nice question. Thank you. Um, I think the, the modernism can be understood in many different ways and the modernist project was obviously a technological project but also a social project and often the, the, the technological project has been the one that has been advanced over the social right, project if you, if you look at sort of the early ideas of modernity. Um, so we feel that that social aspect of modernity is something that has a lot of validity still at this moment. Um, whereas the, say, um, the, maybe the technological, which also comes with a certain expression of, you know, clinginess, if you want, um, is something maybe, well, as you might know, uh, Jing and I uh, met working at SANA, um, and that idea of a sort of, um, perfection in a certain way and a certain, you know, um, tightness and a certain, um, yeah, cleansiness is something which we, by moving, I think, to, to New York and by moving to more uh, diverse contexts, you realize that that sort of idea of, of dimension and of measurement and of alignment um, has to do with tolerance to an extent and that actually tolerance is more important than sort of, you know, uh, eliminating any sort of um, uh, gap between things. And so if you're, if you're, you know, we talk a lot about minimizing tolerance, right? And when we design things like you indicate what is the tolerance and we realize actually you need to sort of start maximizing or maximizing tolerance if you want and allow for things to misalign and allow for things and the process itself to um, inform the, the project. And it has a lot to do with working in many different places and in many different uh, cultures and working with, you know, um, like understanding what it actually means to assemble something and appreciating also what it takes to achieve certain things and then think through okay does it matter or can we think differently about what it so I think it's you know a, a, a truthful observation that that has been something that has affected us a lot and then um, and it's completely changing the way we we think through things but I think even from the first project still 
we were not interested in constructing that form, um, you know, to the sort of, you know, exactly the way it was. Uh, there was not actually a form. It was it, it it fell in its place, so to say. So, the the idea that you can embrace certain outcomes that come out of the process rather than um, saying it has to be like this, you know, from the beginning and not uh, allowing the you know feedback from the, the 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 process of making is something that I think maybe was always in our project, but it, I think it, it, it maybe expanded. Never. It's for everybody. I was really interested, especially in um, the one in Mexico, because we have such an incredible homeless problem here, and and building uh, inexpensive homes, um, you know, wherever we can situate them, and making them appealing, and some of the very simple things you did in terms of, well, first of all, the people who were also involved in, in the construction, which might be something that could be replicated here, I don't know, um, and, and using a texture in a, in a seemingly a very simple way, also a different project where you just turn the bricks around and suddenly you have this interesting texture. And so anyway, I wanted I wondered if you could comment more about using some of these techniques for inexpensive homeless uh, housing in urban areas. I think one thing that is important with the project in Mexico, which I was trying to highlight, is that it is actually, it was the government that built these homes, right? And um, obviously, in this country, we have gradually the government doesn't build things anymore, right? They lease or they um, they allow developers to build certain things. But it actually, it's really interesting if the if the public becomes the, the client, which I think is one important aspect. Um, and then with regards, so and I think that's something we should consider, right? It's like what is the role, so to say, and can because what what happens now often with some of these. Um, with the way in which housing is being provided in this country is that it is still done through tax uh, incentives and but it is done by by the market right and there's a lot of money uh, made and it's very it's sometimes a really disgusting place if you really um, go deep into seeing how housing is, is provided here um, the, the 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 idea of working with um, ordinary materials and you know just thinking through how you can make them a little bit less uh, ordinary I think um, is a very logic one, right? Especially if you have to think about um, like uh, economy. Um, it's just what do you have, but how can you use it in a slightly different way uh, than what it is supposed the way it's supposed to be used? I think we often um, here assume uh, that things, and then it says, "How do I use it?" Or how? Is, and there is there is a lot of um, I would say. Um, you know, specifications or pre-description of how materials are being used, uh, more so maybe uh, here than in some of, you know, in some other places where there's much more um, sort of crafting uh, on site. So I think those are things indeed that we could um, consider and bring um, uh, here as well. But there's a lot of regulate, there's a lot of things that work against some of those applications here, even the way, the, you know, labor is organized and certain things that certain labor pools wouldn't do, for instance. And so you have to, it's always a little bit of, you know, pushing here and there. But I think just in general, the approach of working with, with what is readily available and asking to use it in a slightly different way is, you know, already can go a long way. Yeah. Hi, um, thank you for it. Um, so, first time I see your project, especially coaching library, and my first impression was kind of like an adaptation, the way that the Western way of adaptation of Sana's vocabulary, and which in like in several projects I could read more as with the thickness heaviness, gravity, and so on, which is like a little bit different from Sana's, you know, uh, more like spatial expression. And then I'm, I'm just very curious that you work from, you work at Sana, and then you started working at, in the Western country, especially in the United States, and how that kind of um, vocabulary, or what, what have you learned from Sana, or what you, um, yeah. Uh, those methodologies being adapting to the Western kind yeah. of building landscapes. I'm just very curious about the way of translating yeah. the language, but also with your own style. I think 
So first of all, um, I work together with uh, Jing uh, Liu. She, she was born in Nanjing, then Japan, and then studied at Tulane and ended up um, in New York. Uh, I studied in the Netherlands in Delft. Uh, we learned to make extremely rational diagrammatic buildings. Um, that style is quite popular now as well, the, di the diagram building, which comes through, you know, um, and, and you see it um, in the work like BIG, for instance, um, which is a certain method. Um, when I um, graduated in the Netherlands, I thought I need to learn something very different. Sergio Makemi, she gave a talk. There was no uh, rational explanation, just very intuitive um, uh, articulation of what she preferred over something else. So I was really um, intrigued to understand how did that design process work. And that's why I um, decided to learn more and, and to realize that everything that I thought worked uh, in a certain way, in a certain context in the Netherlands, worked completely differently in that context. And so maybe one of the main um, lessons out of that experience is if you go and if you position yourself into something that is completely unfamiliar to you, you realize that there's many different ways in which things can be done. And so you can learn by you know relocating and, and expanding, so to say, your, your vocabulary. Um, and then I ended up, often having to explain the work we did in Japan. I worked there for eight years in the West. And so I had to sort of post-rationalize a lot of intuitive decisions. It's like, why is it that way? And it's like, well, and you know, you had to sort of figure through and come up with argumentation for things that were really quite um, um, intuitive, I would say. And so um, I, I think, I, I don't really have an, uh, like a sort of formula for you, but I think one of the things that, that is very interesting is also the idea of misunderstanding or misinterpretation or like sort of, um, you know, a sort of hybridization of, of certain things. And I, I don't know if I can, you know, I, I think it's interesting to see if there's still traces, but it is also something that continues to uh, evolve. And every time we go to a place, we discover something new. I think uh, Jig and I are, are quite uh, constantly in dialogue and observing things and discovering things. And, you know, it's it's really a way, I don't think it's such a good idea to think there's like East and West or there's like, you know, this sort of camps, so to say. I think you, you need to look around, be curious, try to appreciate, you know, how things are being done differently and see if through slight transformations, they make sense in another place. And that, that really enriches sort of, you know, everybody's uh, lives. Yeah. One last question. Sure. Um, thanks so much for, for the presentation, and it's it's really great how you uh, framed the projects and the projects that you you decided to present. I mean, it, it seems so clear in retrospect that when people zig, so will zags. Like that, when there's a tendency to do something, that it, that, that there are things that. Um, that the office does that are counter to that in a really, seems like a really conscious way. And so, you know, getting back to some of the other comments, it seems like, yeah, you, you're, you're from the Netherlands, Jing is from China, you guys work together in Japan, and then you decide to come to New York, which I don't know, is either obvious or completely not obvious. And then the projects that you do, you know, start as these like really beautiful, projects that have scale and a high degree of resolution um, with the various scales. But like, you know, the, the projects that you presented now, they, um, they're technological, and it's super sophisticated in terms of money and in terms of the forest, but they all have indications of labor so deeply imprinted in it. So you, you talked about experience, you talked about the, the the contact between people and buildings. You know, you talked about the inefficiencies in terms of the ratios for um, for development. But I think like the, the thing that becomes so tangible in all of it is that you you um, consciously decided that materials would be marked by repetition. They can only be achieved by labor, whether it's months or like the 11 degree shift at Warren in the mainstream or the um, Mexico project. So what, what is that dimension of, of indicating the, the stamp of, of the making that, that you know, often in American production, like you said, is the thing that gets released yeah. through, through efficiency. Right? I mean, is that something you consciously want to frame today? Or is that something that, that is, is something that you're exploring in terms of, in terms of the work you're doing? 
I don't I, I don't think I specifically thought that's what we're going to be talking about, but it is something we're talking about a lot um, today. Um, I think we should realize as architects that we never make a building, like literally you never make a building. Um, it's not your land, it's not your money, it's not your material, it's not your labor. Um, you only talk about it, right? You communicate it, you express it, you try to find somebody to believe in, you know, an idea and then you have to convince somebody else to actually put it together and maybe somebody else to actually pay for it. So I think you have to acknowledge that we as architects, we never actually make a building. Um, and so it means also that you have to figure out if you want to participate in the construction of worlds, so to say, you have to engage, right, with a lot of different uh, people that do uh, actually are more uh, making buildings. And I think um, we've, and this is maybe one thing I learned uh, at SANA, is that you actually have to really understand materials and you have to understand how things go together. We always build every detail, one-to-one -one scale. And it is, you know, it's building is the assembly of, of atoms and locating them in space. And you have to sort of understand how they work and how you move them. And was this indeed the embedded carbon of, a, you know, moving one thing to the other? And what is the cost of those things? And so I think you can learn a lot from people who actually make buildings. And so that's why it's very good early on to engage with people. There's much more risk often for those people as well, right? I think we, you know, we move our Rhino model around and, and hit 3D print and then, um, you know, that's it. But actually, you know, there is, it is a real, um, so we, as you know, maybe we start to build our own office. And that's sort of the most real we have gotten. Um, but I think it's also just a joy, you know, that we have in engaging with, you know, the the, the, the world and, and with these physical realities and with their constraints. So I, I, I think it is something that has maybe always been there. And I think certainly, uh, you know, when Jing and I sort of committed to believing that architecture can live in the world at a, in 2008, it was a really bad idea, speaking about counter <laughs> ideas. But, you know, you have to get your hands dirty and your uh, boots muddy, so to say. And so, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, it is it is very much part of what we uh, think is right. So, thank you. Thank you.